there. I'm Cindy Linden, and this is a Cook Along Podcast Quick Bite. I've been asked to tell you a little bit about myself. My apologies in advance to the people who've heard some of these stories on my cooking podcasts, but I may repeat myself because there are people who may listen to this podcast before they listen to anything else that I've done. I guess I start at the beginning. I am born. I was born in Boulder, Colorado. We moved to Portland, Oregon when I was 13 years old, and that's where I've now spent the majority of my life. I am the oldest of three children, and my father was a professional magician. That meant that at around the age of 10, I and my younger sister and eventually my brother got incorporated into the Family Magic Act. And once in a while, we got pulled out of school because we had a gig in some other state. We were doing a show. And I got to tell you, there is nothing quite so cool as getting pulled out of school and being able to tell your friends that you have a show you have to go do in some faraway state. It was kind of magical. It didn't happen a lot. It only happened a few times in my childhood, but it was very cool when it happened. Sometimes the trip, it was uncomfortable. We were packed into just a regular passenger van, but it was one of those sort of rectangular Dodge vans. My parents and three kids and two magical rabbits and all of the huge stage illusions were packed into this van. So as you can imagine, the magic tricks had to come apart into pretty small pieces. And we learned how to put them together, we kids or at least help some. My father had built them all and my mother had decorated them with paint and glitter and they were the amazing Aladdins. And well, I guess I should say we were the amazing Aladdins and that was my first taste of show business. I fell in love with live theater because my father was also a participant in a couple of local community theater groups. So one day at about the age of 10, he took me to see what it was like backstage after a show. The show was a musical Brigadoon. And so there were a lot of people on stage in period costumes, singing and dancing, and they looked beautiful. And it's a romantic story. And when you go backstage, those illusions are completely shattered. There are a lot of half-dressed people, and at the time, you were allowed to smoke indoors, and a lot of colorful language and <laughs> laughter, and it was just bawdy and raucous, and not at all like the lyrical romance I'd just seen on stage. And I realized that these people were having an enormous amount of fun, and I thought at that moment, that was what I wanted to be when I grew up. I wanted to be part of that magic so I pursued theater in high school and I uh, got a college degree in theater. And there's a thing that happens to actors. They often tend to feel incomplete if they're not working on a show. This was in the days when most theater actors were not paid for their work. The reward was really in the camaraderie and creating the art together and building something wonderful to share with audiences. Many of us actors would go from show to show. You'd start rehearsals while you were still just wrapping up performances for the show before. And sometimes there might be a gap of a couple of weeks or a month. If it was more than two months and people asked you what you were working on, you would sort of uncomfortably say, I'm between projects right now because it felt so odd to not be working in a show. So I was part of that both on stage and behind the scenes. I was a co-founder of a theater company and acted. During that time, I was making my living as a private voice teacher. I had been studying voice for a long time at that point, And my teacher suggested that I might give up my workaday job that was making me crazy and start teaching singing. While that seemed improbable to me at first, the more I thought about it, the more I kind of liked the idea. So I went into private voice instruction, specializing in work with actors. And I actually spent a career doing that. That was not my intent when I began it. It was simply the next thing to do. 
but I spent over 30 years as a teacher of singing in private practice, and that included musical direction for high school musicals, community theater musicals, acting classes for young people. I am told that I am always humming something. I am only told that because I'm really not aware of it. I am often singing things under my breath. If I am not doing that, chances are awfully good. I am talking out loud to myself. I also talk to inanimate objects, encourage bottles or jars to open, and computers to do the right thing. There came a day when I was going to be on my own to support my three kids. And as a single parent, you have to have a pretty predictable, stable income. So at that point, I moved into my second career as a nonprofit arts administrator for various theater companies and music companies. While I was doing that, I discovered some things that during the times when I wasn't doing theater, whether that was in a hiatus when I was raising kids or during the time that I was mostly working behind the scenes, I learned that if you're a creative person and you stop creating in the form that you've been doing it, your brain and your hands kind of find their own ways to continue to express themselves. It turns out that my brain really doesn't shut off the creative process. So if I wasn't on stage, then I was doing some other artistically creative thing. I made two albums of lullabies and marketed those. They did pretty well. The first one had a heartbeat in the background. The second one was for slightly older kids. That was a pretty cool project and sort of in line with my general interests. But then I got into this thing of making paper mache masks with toilet paper instead of newspaper. And you can turn it into a kind of clay. And so here I was making all these interesting life-size masks that could be worn or they could be hung for decor. They had jewels on them. They had interesting paint. They had interesting objects I found or feathers or stones or all kinds of very weird stuff. And I sold those for a while because somehow the art had to redeem itself by making money. I think that's a mistake. Unfortunately, that is the way my brain works, but I would hope There are people better about making art for the sake of art, which may have been what I'm doing now with my cooking, but we'll get there in a bit. I also created a recipe for dog cookies. It was a yummy recipe for dogs anyway, and my family wasn't crazy about when I made batches of them. They stink up the house pretty badly. My family wasn't thrilled about that particular project, but there was that. I became half of a song and dance team. I'm jumping now. I I, I don't even know where I am in the time frame of things. But a song and dance team, like your Fred and Ginger kind of team. It was good. It was fun. It was a hoot and a half, actually. We did a number of shows. We did that for about 10 years, performing at senior residences and community events and putting on our own full-length two-hour shows on occasion. Some of it was movie musical, Mickey, Rooney, Judy Garland stuff, and musical theater stuff. And sometimes there were some more lyrical spots that were actually really beautiful to dance. He was in tails, and I was in long gowns, and it was very cool. It was a very cool way to spend my creative energy. We were Lyndon and Warren, the song and dance team. (laughs) That was really a lot of fun. I did some writing for a while. I have a few short stories that I've written and posted online. I did a one-person show that I performed several times, wrote it, created it. It was a kind of cabaret act that had stories interspersed between the songs, and it ran about 85 minutes, and there was no break. And that was glorious. That's lovely. I tried to stay down close to the people I was performing for so that I could interact with them and talk with them and share my stories in a personal way. And oh my goodness, that was so cool and so rewarding. And now a couple of days a week, I work for Penzi's Spices because I decided I didn't want to be responsible for other people's stuff anymore. I just wanted to do something fun. 
So when you hear me talk about a Penzi Spice, which I do from time to time because they have some really great stuff, it's partly because I know about what they create and what they do because I work with them. I started the Cook Along podcast. And if you want to hear the fun story of how that came about, look for another Quick Bite podcast called How Did We Get Here? And you're probably sitting there wondering why the heck I've told you all of this, because what's that got to do with what I'm doing on the Cook Along podcast? So here's a quick summary of my cooking life. I grew up baking with my mom just a little bit, doing the sort of behind-the-scenes work that people let kids do. I took a home ec class in the seventh grade where I learned to make homemade applesauce and blueberry muffins, and I still have those recipes and use them to this very day. I didn't cook at all, really, during high school or college or during my first stint in my own apartment. Because who does during those stages? I mean, I barely ate. I was barely home. No matter where I was living, cooking was not an option at all because I didn't care what I was eating. I just needed to get it over with and get on with my life. And then I got married and started experimenting. I made a lot of bread. I was raised on meat, potatoes, and vegetables. And pasta was spaghetti with a jarred sauce. My mother actually was, I thought she was a good cook. I liked her food and I still use some of her recipes and you will find some of her recipes on the Cook Along podcast. But fancy was not something she did. And that I actually learned, I think, from my voice teacher who introduced me to, what do you call it? It was a chicken breast and it had crab and asparagus and either a Bernays or a Hollandaise or something over the top. And I was like, oh. Oh, there's more than meat and potatoes. And that sort of started my curiosity. During the time I was a single mom, that was my Hot Pockets and Frozen Pizza era. That's what my kids mostly ate because I'd come home from work and they'd get home from school and we just didn't really care. We just needed food. There was no art about it. There was no finesse about it. It was just food. And... Sometimes I needed things that they could heat up on their own. So I wasn't doing any cooking during that period, except for holidays and special occasions, when really we went all out and had great meals. I would have told you in my youth that I loved baking and didn't care much for cooking. The reason being that baking was chemistry and magic, and you put a bunch of stuff together and you came out with something new. Whereas with cooking... You stirred a bunch of things together and came out with the same things stirred together in just perhaps a different temperature. So it it didn't interest me, but it does now very much. In fact, I think that my creative juices are more excited and stimulated by cooking than anything creative I've done in a very long time. I just kind of obsess over it. What started the new cooking frenzy? I have no idea. Really don't know. I just know that I started cooking things and then I started reading things and somewhere in the combination of reading and watching videos and just cooking and experimenting, I started to say I fell in love. I I think I did. I love cooking. It's so exciting. It's so rewarding. It's ridiculous how much time I spend researching it and thinking about it and Working toward that 10,000 hours, you know, that makes you an expert at something. I guess that's what I'm working on. And nowadays, in addition to always humming something, I'm always cooking something. There's always something on the stove, something in the oven, or something in my head that I'm going to do in a little bit. I love learning new techniques. I love learning secrets about how to do things in ways that are better or easier or creamier or sweeter or more intense or whatever. That's who I am today. I think of myself now as a cook. If you ask me what I do, I will tell you I cook. That's a little slice of who your host, Cindy Linden, is. It would be truly wonderful if you could help me continue making my podcast by contributing a little tiny bit of cash every once in a while. 
you can donate using the little Help Frost the Cake button on your Acast app. And if you don't use Acast for your podcasts, please visit patreon.com and look for the Cook Along podcast and you can make a contribution there and get printable copies of my recipes as I release them as podcasts. If you're interested, you can see a couple of snippets from the one-person show, which I called Ledges, at cindylinden.com slash in-performance. You can see pictures of the song and dance team there. You can see a couple of snips of me performing solo and one snip, I think, of the song and dance team at work. I hope you have found this at least mildly entertaining. Tell your friends you listen to the Cook Along podcast. I will cook with you again next week. Remember, the quick bites are every other week. And the recipes are the weeks between those. Brand new recipes every other week. Until next time, happy cooking.